Hi, I'm Matt. I'm a senior front-end developer at Nulogy. I'm also a committer on backbone.marionette. We're looking for people. If anybody is interested, just, yeah, let me know. These are all of the various ways you can get in touch with me. Uh, I'll put these slides up on my slide share and demo app on my GitHub afterwards. Right, so backbone.marionette. I think that in today's day and age, if we're going to be talking about Backbone in a general way, uh, to actually like to choose Backbone to build a large scale app today, when there's so many different frameworks available, we need to actually do, so, do a little bit of justification. It seems like there's been a lot of uh, first of all, there's been a lot of bad experiences with Backbone that's been building up over time, and it's been giving the framework more and more of a bad name. Kind of get into that in a moment. And the second thing is that uh, as these new frameworks come out, they do, they seem to do like more and more and more stuff. And it just seems like at this point, why would somebody use Backbone when these other things are available? Now. When Backbone came out, it was an amazing and revolutionary thing. And the ideas behind Backbone had been kind of out there in the community for ages and ages. I remember talking to people on IRC about like kind of splitting, uh, splitting behavior away from the DOM and keeping those types of code separate like years before Backbone came out. But uh, Backbone was the first thing that really kind of packaged everything up in a clear and concise way saying like, this, this is the way that you should be building these types of applications. It came about at the right time, in the right way, and just like kind of took off. Uh, the strengths of Backbone are really in its simplicity. It's, it's more of a philosophy than it is a framework. Uh, its philosophy is, like I said, you have your DOM code, and you have your, your business logic, for lack of a better term, your logic code. And your logic code shouldn't really be interacting with your DOM code, and your DOM code should be like kind of nicely encapsulated with with very clear mediation in between them. So, given that there's all these alternatives for frameworks nowadays, as technologists, it's our job to decide what's the best for our specific project. All JS frameworks have strengths and weaknesses. If somebody says like Backbone's horrible because it, you'll build like a big ball of mud. Well, you know, there's, there's a bit of truth to that where uh, Backbone doesn't give you guidance that other frameworks do. But on the other hand, uh, Backbone also offers a greater deal of flexibility than pretty much anything else out there. So that, that's also kind of a strength on the other side. Uh, you could say something like uh, Backbone doesn't offer, like Backbone doesn't offer data binding out of the box. Backbone doesn't offer all of these wonderful things that framework X or Y offers. Uh, but then again, on the other hand, you can say that uh, if there's a problem going on, you can dive into the code at pretty much any point and know what's going on because it's so simple. Yeah, it's simplicity and it's flexibility are really the reasons that, that somebody would choose Backbone nowadays over, over something else. And again, like it's, it's, our it's our job to do these evaluations without bias that might crop up over time. Uh, for Nulogy, we build very complex, large, complex in terms of business logic and large applications. Because of that, we being constrained into certain, archi in, into certain architectural decisions or certain architectural frameworks is something that's actually a very big negative for us. If you are developing something that isn't quite as complex like as complex with business logic, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If somebody's saying like, you know, put this kind of code here, put that kind of code there, tie them together this way, and then magic happens, that can work great for specific types of problems. That's not our problems. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that we went this way. And then the other way reason would be uh, just in terms of Again, the complexity thing, we have to support very old browsers. Everybody here probably knows how hard it is to debug JavaScript on like IE8, for example. If you're, if you're having to debug JavaScript and you're like lost somewhere inside framework code that you have no idea what's going on, it could be really, really, really difficult. 
uh, having this level of simplicity means that even if you're in the middle of this nasty framework code, you can still kind of understand what ha what's happening because it's, it's such simple code. So what's Marionette? Marionette is something that's built on top of Backbone. Backbone gives you a set of primitives to think about these simple form ways of building web applications. So if, if you aren't aware of it, Backbone gives you a model. A model represents a piece of data with behavior, basically. Uh, it gives you a collection, which is a collection of models, and it gives you views, which are basically represent pieces of the DOM that uh, will listen to changes on the DOM and update models, and listen to changes on the models and update the DOM. They're there to perform that level of mediation. So Backbone or Marionette takes these steps of takes these primitives a few steps further. Uh, it still maintains that level of simplicity. So even though Marionette is significantly larger than Backbone, if you're in some really bad situation where you have to debug JavaScript on a horrible old browser, uh, the stuff that it's doing is still really not that complicated. It's just a few steps past where Backbone already is. It also gives you some primitives for building larger scale applications. If you are, if, if you're building something simple, then all you really need is like a bunch of views and then you tie them in all together in a really big function and then you're fine. If you're building so something complex, then uh, you want to be, for example, splitting things apart into modules, splitting things apart, splitting your initialization code away from the rest of your code, being able to, uh, to start and stop modules with it, like start and stop modules to have changes not in one module, not cascade through your entire app and just break everything. Uh, Marionette gives you all of these things. So what are these primitives that Marionette gives you? The first thing that it does is a whole bunch of stuff in the view where by introducing some conventions, it gets rid of a lot of boilerplate. So if, you're, if you've done any work in Backbone, uh, one thing that's kind of a pain is that you have to write the same render method over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, this is because Backbone takes a very hands-off approach to how you're actually generating your HTML. Marionette takes the approach that uh, this is something that, is some, that, that just happens everywhere. So by giving some conventions, it can take care of that for you. Uh, it takes care of template management. Again, you tell it how you want your templates to be built, and it will build them for you and manage them for you and whatnot. By default, it uses the underscore templates, and it's expecting uh, template properties to be referring to the ID of a script tag that has that template HTML in it inside the DOM. But it's very simple to change that, as I'll show soon. <laughs> Uh, it provides a UI object. This is a simple, single place where you can kind of configure the different interesting parts of your view. So like, let's say you have a view that has, uh, that has like an OK button and a cancel button. Uh, if you're referring to those two buttons, like all over the place inside your view, and your view is like 50, 60, 70 lines long, then uh, if, if the HTML for that button changes, then you have to go through all of that code and update it. The other thing is that sometimes these selectors can get kind of long, and the UI element gives a nice separation there. I'll, I'll get into that more as well. Provide some memory management features. The way that uh, jQuery works, and Backbone's been criticized that for this for quite a while, uh, the way that jQuery events work is that if you're binding to an object, uh, even if that object, like, you don't really need it anymore, the, uh, as long as the DOM node exists anywhere, <laughs> then uh, it will keep that object in memory. And if you have a large application, that means uh, that object won't be garbage collected, and sooner or later you're going to run out of memory. Uh, so what... Marionette does is in its closed method, it will actually unbind all, like all of the events, clean up everything for you. It's very nice. Um, the other thing that's cool is that it has many extensibility points to that you can customize pretty much any of these behaviors. If you want to change your templating system, as I mentioned, it's very very simple. If you want to uh, change the way, like add some logic to how the template which template is getting rendered is very, very simple to override a method.
So as you can see here, um, this is kind of like a bare bones marionette item view. All you really have to define is like some template identifier. You pass it a property called model, and then you call render. And it, what it will do is it'll uh, call dot to JSON on the model to get the data. It'll look up the template by the template identifier, pass the data to the template identifier, and then ram that into the this dot el's HTML, which is cool because you don't have to write that. So this is an example of the UI object. So here we have a view that has a main button. And you can see after a render, this.ui.main button will always be updated as a jQuery object that's always pointing to the, the correct thing. So elsewhere in your code, you don't have to do that lookup over and over and over again. So these are some features that are just kind of present in all the different view types. Uh, the kind of bread and butter view type, I guess, would be the uh, Marionette item view. An item view is a view that's rendered based on your model's data. So anytime that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a model and a view, you use an item view. So it's expecting a model property. It's expecting a template property. Don't have to worry about render. Uh, there's a nice little model events object. So you can say when there's a change to this event, then call this function. It works just like the events, the events object uh, normally does on Backbone, which is pretty cool. Uh, the cool thing about this is that it moves your views closer to being totally declarative. Like the less, the less imperative code that you have in the views, you're better, are better. So yeah, next on the list is the collection view. A collection view is literally, it's like I have a list of elements. I want a view to be rendered for each element in that list. So one thing that's cool about a collection view is it automatically re-renders on add, remove, change, all of those things. So if a view changes, it'll re-render that one view. If a view is added to the collection, it'll add that view, the view's element to the DOM, basically. Uh, same thing with remove. It also, prov like, all you have to do is give it an item view. And here, switch to this guy. So here you can see that we have a list item. The list item is the view for like one item in the list, obviously. Uh, we have a list, and then you pass a collection to the list, and you call render, and it'll render one list item, which gets passed a model for every item that's in that collection. So again, if, if this might not seem terribly impressive if you come from other frameworks. If you come from Backbone, this is actually like, oh my god. <laughs> and then finally, we have composite views. So composite views are a combination of an item view and a collection view. They're great for things like master detail. So if you have like a single item that is, uh, if, if you have a, a list of items and they're kind of like just in short form and when you click on them, then the single items information gets filled out, works great for that. Uh, it's also great because a collection view, uh, the collection element is the thing that's kind of the container for its items. With a composite view, if you're building something like a table or you're building something more complex, then its collection view is kind of like embedded within itself. So I'll, I'll kind of cover uh, the composite view a bit more later. The next kind of category of primitives that Marionette gives you are view containers. The basic view container is a region. So the point of a region is a region takes a view and it shows the view and then you can either close it, which will close the view, or uh, you can pass another view to it, in which case it closes the old one and adds the new one. The cool thing about regions is they're kind of a wall for you between the, the code that actually has to know about the specifics of the page and the rest of your view code, which can be generic and like unit tested and whatnot. There's also layouts. Layouts are for when, so in the case of a composite view, you have kind of like an item view with a collection view contained within it. Uh, in the case of a layout, it's more that you have an item view with multiple child views contained within it. It's for more kind of customized widget type things. 
The final piece, or I guess the next piece of, uh, of Marionette would be application structure primitives. So Marionette is designed for building larger scale applications. Larger scale applications are gonna have certain things that Backbone just doesn't wanna talk about because Backbone is really designed for building any type of application. So the first thing in this class of primitives is the application object. The application object is a, a place where you can kind of do your initial bootstrapping, where you can wire up your regions. Uh, it's the thing that kind of like knows about the specifics of the page as it's on the screen and kind of kicks everything else off. For anybody who's built this kind of code, you'll know that like at the beginning, there's not much of this. It could be like five, 10 lines, but eventually it gets more and more and more and more. So there's a specific object in Marionette built to handle that. You also have modules. A lot of people get confused with modules where um, it's kind of like, okay, I'm starting writing my code. I built my application. I kind of understand that, but I don't really understand what a module is for. Uh, the reality is a module is for like three weeks later when you have a whole lot of code going on and it's really kind of not very clear anymore. Um, in your in your initial bootstrapping, like what's related to what? You have like three hundred lines of like, okay, I'm gonna take this this data and ram it into that collection and I'm gonna give it to that view and put it in this region and all of that. What a module's for is splitting that code apart where you can say, okay, so for the sidebar, uh, we have like this kind of initialization that has to happen. And then all of that code gets hidden behind that module. And that module can then be started and stopped the same way as anything else. So if uh, you're building a larger scale single page application, there are certain resources that will need to stick around forever. There's other resources that are more transient that you'll want at one point, but then you won't want later on. Uh, modules let you basically start and stop those very easily and at a high level without having to think about the details. You also have controllers. So when people look at Marionette controllers, they're thinking like kind of Rails style MVC controllers. It's not what it's really there for. It's more uh, think about it as like a use case controller where it's there's this specific type of action that requires a high level of coordination between multiple different objects. To accomplish that action, you can either kind of spread that coordination logic all over the place, or what's better is put it into a single place and have, have the coordination separate from the objects that actually do some stuff. So that's what controllers are there for. So like, uh, let's say like, I don't know, uh, checking out of a shop with your shopping cart or something. Uh, at the beginning, it could be a very simple thing where you're just saying like model.checkout. But later on, there could be like several different objects that require coordination between them to perform that given action. So you could either pass all of those objects into one other object, or you could say like, you know what? This doesn't really belong anywhere. This is an action all by itself. And that's what controllers are for, to represent those actions. So then the last piece is application level communication. And this piece is probably a bit more controversial than the other pieces. Um, people already say that Backbone, the way that events work in Backbone and JavaScript in general are very hard to understand. It's hard to follow code and whatnot. So um, what Marionette is saying is that, well, well, events don't necessarily make sense at the low level. They do make a lot of sense at the high level. If it's easy to just call a function on an object, if those objects kind of live in the same neighborhood and uh, it's totally fine if they know about each other, then just like kind of call the function. Uh, if it's more along the lines of like something's happening in the application and other like completely separate parts of the application need to know about it or need to respond to it, that's where events come in. Um, so to accomplish that, it kind of, it gives you several primitives to work with. The first is the event aggregator. Uh, for anybody who does node stuff, it's exactly the same thing as an event emitter. It's basically one part of the application triggers an event, uh, any other part of the application can listen to that event and respond to it. The event aggregator is, yeah, it's for situations where you just wanna notify the world that something happened. So like, let's say the user logged in there could be like 15 different parts 
that don't really know about each other and don't need to know that much about the authentication code, but they need to know that like, wow, the user logged in, something inside of myself needs to change. That's what the event aggregator is for. The next part is commands. A command is something that can be triggered anywhere, but handled in a single place. So an example of this would be, uh, let's say you're working on something in Word. If you want to save your document, like there's that autosave feature that will just save automatically every like 15 seconds or something. You could also press Command S, or you could hit the Save button on the toolbar, or you could say like File Save. Uh, all of those things are accomplishing exactly the same action, but all of those things from a UI point of view are happening from completely different parts of the application. One of them is handled by the keyboard, another one is just like a background process. So uh, a command, when you register a command handler, what you're saying is that I want to register a global capability for my application that is accessible anywhere. And then the final, the final primitive is uh, for request response. Now, uh, especially in my own team, people aren't super happy with this, and they would prefer to go directly against uh, concrete objects. Uh, like I said earlier, concrete objects are ideal most of the time. And it kind of takes a little while to figure out which, which way is better, going for an event for a given thing or going for a concrete object call. Uh, what request response gives you is that um, there's certain global resources inside the application that just everything needs to know about. And if you don't have request response, then you end up passing around just a, a bunch, like you basically have to pass those around to every level of your application. With request response, it just has to know about how to ask for it and it'll be given it. I put together a small demo so we have a rich table editor here. Uh, the idea is that we have orders and we have users. And users can place orders. And that's, this is kind of what we're representing here. Uh, as you can see, we have a drop down of users, which are the gang of four. There's an order total, and you can enter some notes if you want to. So Eric Gamma ordered something for $200. and. Oh my god, it's Eric. So we can add, and then as soon as a row is added, uh, if we want to, we can edit it and say, no, it wasn't actually Eric, it was Richard Helm. We can save that, or we can cancel. Uh, and then if we don't actually like this, we can hit destroy. So I mean, this is obviously something that people in this room write over and over and over again. Uh, I just thought it was a good small example to show how one would do something like that in Marionette. So this is a Rails project. I'm using a small common JS module loader. So you'll see some requires. So assets, JavaScripts. Okay, so first of all, um, the Rails Asset Pipeline has support. Rails Asset Pipeline is kind of like the, uh, the way that you kind of, it's like grunt for Rails for people who aren't familiar with it. It's got a built-in way of handling client-side templates that will uh, pre-compile these files. So like, for example, orders.jst.hbs, the asset pipeline will take this file, uh, precompile it into a compiled handlebar template, and then ram it onto a global variable on the window called JST. So obviously, Marionette is not built for that. Uh, so I built this small thing here for this called a JST renderer. What it does is it takes in some kind of a template store, and then uh, it basically says if the view template that's passed into me, you basically just have to provide this render function. Uh, and the render function takes in your template identifier and it takes in data and it's expecting HTML back. So I'm saying is, is the template identifier a string? If it is, then look inside the template store. Much bigger monitor at work. <laughs> 
Uh, look inside the template store. If it's not, then uh, it's probably a function, so just pass the data straight to it. Uh, and then it renders it. If it couldn't find it, it raises an exception and it returns it. So then over here, um, I'm saying that override the default marionette renderer with my new template renderer and pass it this JST object. And that's all you really have to do. And then uh, the rest, like marionette, is able to kind of work its magic with just providing uh, template names. So I've got my application here. Uh, you can see this, this is just a small common JS loader. So I'm, I'm requiring a few things. I'm creating my application object. Uh, this is kind of required for Rails. I just kind of rammed it in this file. Uh, here I'm defining my regions. I'm saying that uh, this demo region on the page is where I want to kind of, that's, I want that demo region to be a container for views. That's what this line is saying. And then over here, I'm saying uh, create a new, new users, new orders. Users and orders are both collections. Uh, grab the region, do fetch for both. When they're both done, then create a new order table, passing those in, and show it. So this is kind of like generic everyday initialization code. What's kind of cool about this is, uh, first of all, it's because it's inside an initializer, uh, you can start it and you can also stop it. Uh, the second thing that's cool is that because we're defining our regions at this level, none of the rest of the, of the code inside the application needs to know about the specific structure and layout of, of the page that it's kind of injecting stuff into. Demo. And then you can see down here, I'm saying require marionette demo.start. So that's all you really have to do to start the application. So what the application was actually doing is uh, it was initializing this orders view. So orders is a composite view, which represents the table. Uh, so tag name, class name, like this stuff is uh, old hat backbone stuff. Uh, then we give it the item view, which is order, which I have to find in another file. Uh, so what that means is that for every item in a collection that this is passed, it'll create a new order with, uh, with that model, instantiate it, and uh, add it into the item view container, which is the T body of the table. We also have an empty view, which is no orders, which is right up here. And uh, as you can see, no orders have been placed yet. So that is defined right here. Uh, and then the orders template is here. So it's just like kind of a T header, T head with empty T body. But you can see that everything is super high level, super declarative. Uh, we define our T body. Our, sorry, our item view container, which is the T body. We define our templates. And uh, there's item view options. Item view options, you can add stuff to it, and that'll get passed down to every other item view. Um, since the item views, when you edit them, when they, you edit them, they look exactly like this. They need to know about all of the users. So uh, to do that, so first we're saying that the collection for this table is orders. We're saying that for every item view should receive an option called users, which is being passed in. Uh, I also have this add view. The add view is something because uh, a Marionette composite view um, has kind of like an outer, an outer shell, and it has it, every item inside of itself. So for this add view, I made that a separate thing. So then on, on render, because if you write your own render, you're obviously overriding marionettes. On render happens right after it. Uh, I'm just saying add my rendered add view, and then on close, close it. So this, this guy here is pretty straightforward, I think. Um, for add order, uh, if people haven't seen uh, backbone.sticket before, it's amazing. If you're doing stuff with backbone, I think you should be using it. Uh, but 
again, super declarative. I'm saying these are my bindings from my uh, from my model to the various parts of my template. Uh, just kind of take stuff in. When you save, just call save on the model, add it to the orders. As soon as it gets added to the orders, the the composite view will know to add that to render a new view for that new model added to the DOM. Then unbind kind of the events from the old model, create a new model, rebind events, data binding events. And then finally, we have this order class. So for, yeah, this represents one row in our table. So again, it's a TR, simple template. Uh, here we actually have two templates. We have a template and we have an edit template. Uh, and I also added this mode here. It's not built into Marionette. Uh, these are the events that it does. There's just clicking on the various buttons that are possible. We have more data binding stuff. Uh, and I have, again, edit bindings and re read only bindings. Uh, so get template is something that you can override in Marionette if you want to say, by default, Marionette will just look at the string value of this dot template. If you override get template, you can do whatever you want. So here I'm saying, if we're in read-only mode, then look at then use the normal template. If we're not in read-only mode, use the edit template. Uh, after it renders, it does the same thing with the sticket bindings. Uh, for yeah, this is just stuff to change modes. That's pretty much it.